so we went through this uh, relatively simple description. And this is good enough for doing something like this. Uh, and these are the homework questions that were due today. <laughs> um, I thought you could do it on your own. That's why I had enough signed. So if I'm you know, shining light, this is just a single beam. And when I pass it through double solid, this is kind of what you see. Um, and you see the alternating arrangement of bright and dark fringes, right? And with this simple consideration, what you have enough of is you have enough to say, um, you have enough to say where those fringes are. You have enough to describe the angular position or um, convert using this uh, uh, using this relationship, convert that to the y positions. You have enough information to sort of describe where the bright fringes are and where the dark fringes are. What I want to do right now is going a little bit beyond that, trying to describe the, um, trying to describe the, the intensity pattern. So this is what the intensity pattern looks like, qualitatively speaking. Let me draw it the way we normally draw. Um, so if you see a sketch of this, I don't know, in, on Wikipedia or whatever, you might see the intensity pattern drawn this way, maximum here goes to minimum somewhere here, maximum again, minimum, maximum, minimum, something like this. Oops, I can't do the other side well. All right, that seems good enough. Like, does it, this figure make intuitive sense what it's trying to describe? Yes, so it's trying to describe as a function of y. So if I'm describing an axis here, this would be the, um, this would be the position axis, y, and what I'm trying to draw on the perpendicular axis is the abstract quantity of, we are trying to describe on this perpendicular axis, the intensity of light, how bright that light is. This is the central maximum, that's where it's bright. As you go off to the side, it, this is the first darker fringe where intensity goes to zero. And as you go out farther, you encounter bright fringe again, and dark fringe, bright fringe, and so on. Okay. And um, so in reality, these peaks will get smaller and smaller as you go out. In the idealized version, these peaks have the same height. It's a matter of do you have to account for single slit diffraction, which we'll cover next week. Julie, what do we have uh, scheduled for the lab today? Mm. Uh, that Thursday. Do, if we actually have diffraction, uh, I'll, I'll deal with it on Thursday. I think um, <laughs> the lab actually deals with interference and diffraction. So you have to know something about diffraction going into the lab. Uh, I'll deal with it on Thursday. But so that's how we, um, if, if we are trying to be more quantitative about what you would measure, what you would see, this is how you, we might describe, describe the intensity that way. And um, so, you know, this intensity, it could be described as a, Function, um, so let me just use letter I. We could describe this uh, uh, intensity as a function of position. And just the position because we are imagining, averaging it over some time because we don't really see the oscillation of electric field. Okay? So the, uh, the mathematical calculation that I want to go through now is how to drive this intensity as a function of height. And you already know what kind of features you would expect. You already know whatever you get at y equals zero, you should get maximum, some kind of amplitude of this oscillation of a sort. And as you go out in either direction, it's going to go to zero. It'll never be negative. There's no such thing as negative intensity. And um, it'll get maximum again. So it's going to be something sinusoidal, but uh, modify the version of something sinusoidal. Okay. And uh, so before we go headlong into the whole calculation, let me just uh, step you through a couple um, simplifying conventions. So is everyone here familiar with uh, the definition of intensity in physics? I think even I may not have covered that. I probably didn't cover it in physics 4B. So let me define the word intensity, because <laughs> it's very possible that we haven't defined it. Um, so intensity in physics, is, you can talk about intensity of light. You can actually talk about intensity of other things as well. Intensity is defined as this, power per area. Okay? 
Everyone remembers how power is defined? How is power defined? Daniel. Work over time? Yeah. yeah, so work gives you a change in energy, right? So you can talk about um, uh, work. I want to be a little bit more general. So power would be uh, work or <laughs> I want to talk about change in energy. Change in energy per time or some kind of energy per time. That's the mechanical description of power. And hopefully energy, you have some, some sense of what that is. So this laser pointer, it has a power of, I don't know, I can't read. OK, it says max output power less than 5 milliwatt. So it has a power of 5 uh, milliwatt, let's say, if it's a maximum. So that's the power um, that's in this entire light beam. But depending on where you are looking at this light beam, the size of the light beam actually changes. Near my hand, it's probably, I don't know, diameter 5 millimeters. Seems a little bit big, 3 millimeters. But as you go farther away, even though it, this is a well collimated laser beam, if you go far enough away, it gets bigger. So if you go, you know, 100 meters away, this might be three centimeters. So this has a fixed power, but its intensity changes because as you go farther away, the same amount of power is being spread over a larger area. Okay? So when we are trying to describe intensity, this is what we are trying to describe. That um, so. So let me give you some uh, complicating factors you have to consider. Let's say you have, um, you have, um, I don't know, some light bulb. Um, let's say you know uh, what it is. It's a 60 watt white bulb, light bulb. Uh, what would be its power? Including all the spectrum of light, both visible and invisible. About 60 watt, right? Yeah, visible is a fraction of that, but you know, including everything about 60 watt. Now, suppose if somebody asked you for intensity of this light bulb at some distance, I don't know, one meter away. Somebody asked you for, um, so there's a light coming from this light bulb that's uh, shining everywhere. And someone asks you, what is the intensity? at some one distance one meter away. Do you know how you might estimate or calculate that? You could. Uh, I want to do it with uh, only the information that's on this board. <laughs> uh, if, imagine that I, I have forgotten all of, all of our Maxwell's equations. I don't remember any of it. The area of this piece over uh, 4 pi multiplied 60. Mm, I, uh, all right, so l let me start the other way. Multiply by 60 watt. What else did you say? Uh, the area of this piece. Okay. Divided by 4 pi. That's uh, uh -huh. a circle. Yeah, you are going somewhere close. So this is close, but not quite. Let me give you a simpler way of thinking about this. Intensity one meter away at this spot. Intensity one meter away, I don't know, over here. Do you think they would be at the same intensity? Yeah, in general, right? Let's say this light bulb is uh, omnidirectional. It's, uh, it's not like this laser beam, highly directional. It goes in all directions. So if you make this a simplifying assumption that intensity all around is the same, it makes it a little bit easier to calculate the intensity because you would use the total power and what area would you use? Area of the whole sphere enclosing it, yeah. So for intensity here, this is how I can estimate it quickly. I can say, well, it should be um, the total power, 60 watt, divided by the area, so that's the sphere. So 4 pi times the distance is, uh, squared. 4 pi times 1 meter squared. So that would be the intensity. It would be a function of distance. As you go farther away, it would fall off at distance squared. And hopefully, all of this makes intuitive sense mechanically, right? 
All right, so, so this is one consideration I want you to just uh, have in the back of your head. And all of this is consistent with the conservation of energy and all that good stuff that hopefully you <laughs> seems familiar to you. Um, now, where's my eraser? <laughs> Let me tell you the, what an experimental setup for double slit interference might be like. So for a double slit interference, it might be like this. You could have a single slit. This is the picture you saw over there, which lets in some light through. So there's light that's uh, diffracted through this single slit that we'll talk about on Thursday, starting on Thursday. And then we have a double slit. It's uh, trying to center it. Um, we have double slit. Oops, uh, wait, if I'm centering it. So some fraction of this light that's reaching this uh, double slit screen would go through here. That. Some would go through here. Let's say, um, let's say you knew the intensity of light at this point. You know intensity I naught. And let me make this simple for now. Um, let's just say I'm going to block off the other slit. So for the time being, you don't have to worry about this second slit here. All you are worried about is the first slit, slit number one. Mm, let me do that in blue. Slit number one. And on this screen, let's say I'm looking at what is the intensity as, as a, some function of y um, due to slit number one alone. Let me ask you this question. Um, if you, if you were given this, um, if you're just given this information, let me give you a little bit more information. Let's say you know the light source, you know the distance zero, you know the distance one, and you know the final screen distance. Do you feel like you have complete set of information in determining intensity here? as a what fraction of intensity here? Yeah, I'm hoping you feel this is an underdetermined problem because you do have to know what the size of the slit is here, here. There's a bunch of more information that you would, should feel like you need to know. So I want you, to, want you to start from there. But let's say I ask you this question. I simply want to, all I want to do is, um, let's say I have I naught, and given this I naught, I know this function. And I'm now going to just describe the changes to it. Let's say I double the intensity here. How do you think this intensity should change? Double, whatever it was, it would not be double, right? So we can deal in proportionalities. We can deal with this light intensity here being proportional to some original light intensity. So this is the language I want to use. So I actually want to get rid of all these because they're not adding anything new. So I just want to talk about slits one and two. So I have slits one and two. And um, I have some intensity of light here that would be due to slit one alone. And some intensity of light here that would be due to slit number two alone. And in fact, let me put it this way, that let's say the intensity of light, um, let's say the I naught is intensity of light due to either slit alone. Uh, intensity of light at the screen. Yep. 
So this is a simplifying convention I'm introducing. If you, um, if, uh, if you are doing the other thing, where I give you the uh, magnitude of electric field here, I mean, you know, there is some amplitude of electric field here, E naught. And, but if I'm starting from that and ask you to calculate the intensity here, there's a bunch of things you're going to need to take into account. So to make our calculation simpler, what we are going to say is that we can kind of measure what the intensity would be if there was only one slit. And if there is only one slit, the pattern of intensity, at least approximately, what it should look like is it should, you know, send, you should sort of pick out in the center and then kind of get you know, smaller as you go farther away. And if this slit is narrow enough, this is going to spread out so much that your intensity. So this is the sort of baseline intensity. Uh, this intensity I naught is the, it, uh, this intensity. That's uh, what intensity you would have with a single slit and nothing else. 